happy days tonight. Let's stand for a second. We're about to get into the word of God. Let's stand for a second. Stay where you are, but give your neighbor a high five. Tell them Jesus loves them. Get your blood flowing. We are about to dive deep into the word of God under uh, the title of the cornerstone. Once your blood is flowing, feel free to have a seat as we prepare to delve into the word of God. I had an interesting, you know, <laughs> uh, elder, elder, brother, elder McTavish um, was telling me, you know, he preached a powerful word. It's been a few weeks now. Um, it's a thing in the McTavish household. He's preaching powerful word. Um, we might have to get Akila up there one of these days. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. We'll surprise her. Amen. <laughs> one day we'll show up. Akita, you preach it. <laughs> no, but he, he was expressing to me how, man, when you when you when you dare to say that I'm going to stand in front of God's people and deliver God's word to God's people, then you're going to experience things. Yeah. Like you, you're going you're going to whether it be the week of or uh, leading up to, God's going to give you opportunities. You know, I never like to give the devil credit. He don't get credit for nothing. Look, even in the garden, that was Adam and Eve's choice. Right? <laughs> right? 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 All he could do was create the opportunity, right? We give the devil too much credit, so I'm going to give Jesus all the credit. He, he, he will create opportunities. He will give you opportunities. To make the word come to life. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Um, not just not this week immediately, but the week before, um, I was, there, there's this campground. I won't, I won't say it because I don't want to get sued for um, um, putting someone's name out there. But there's this campground near our house. We live down in Henry County. You know, Henry County is what Kennesaw was 20 years ago, yeah. right? Cobb County was 20 years ago. This used to be Main Street Kennesaw was out in the cut, right? It used to be way out there. Now it's just, you know, the other day I was in that gas station down the corner and it seemed like, it seems like an old country gas station that's in the middle of the city, right? Because this used to be an old country road, right? But Atlanta has just, just, just in, engulfed, like, like Kennesaw is just part of Atlanta. In fact, you can keep going for another 10, 20, minutes and you're still in Atlanta, right? That's what Henry County is right now. We live in Stockbridge, man. Even in the, the six years we've been in our house, places that were once cow pastures are now subdivisions in five years time. Like they, they, they're building houses and apartments before they build roads and schools. Come on, you know, that's what it, they can't get nowhere. Like don't get on the road on a Friday afternoon. You're not going nowhere. You get just the Sabbath preparation done, stuff done on Thursday because you're not doing it on Friday. But so there's this campground. It's not too far from our house. And, and this place has been there for 112 years. It's a Christian campground, 112 years. And you can tell, I mean, it, it, it is surrounded by subdivisions. But the property that they have is all wooded except for the, their, their little campground houses cafeteria they have in the middle of the woods. But it's surrounded by Atlanta now. Like, it was out in the cut before, but, I mean, 100 years ago, Atlanta was, wasn't even Atlanta. You know? <laughs> Atlanta had wasn't even Atlanta yet 100 years ago. But so this thing has been out in the cut for centuries, but it's not anymore. It's part of the city now. Um, but it's at this intersection where you can go to the, the light and take a right. Or if there's a lot of traffic, there's this road that goes through the campground, which appears to be a public road. Now, I always thought it was a public road. I always thought it was a way to avoid this intersection. Um, week before last week, I'm driving through and I, I get waved down by somebody. And so I, I stopped and he said, uh, I just want you to know this is a Christian campground. <laughs> and I said, um, well, praise God, <laughs> you know, like, uh, thank you, <laughs> you know, are you advertising, like, what is going on, he said, you can't be here, and I said, um, well, you know, I'm just on a public road, he said, this isn't a public road, and I said to him, it seems to be a public road, 
It's on the map like a public road. It doesn't have any gates or any signs that says it's not a public road. So I thought it was a public road. He said, well, it's not. And we only let certain people on this campground. Ooh. And I said, oh, oh, OK, well, I guess I'm not certain people, all right? And uh, so maybe if I shaved my head and took the bass out of my voice, Brother De La Cruz, it might be some. <laughs> I might be certain people, but 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 so <laughs> but so so I, I'm like okay. I said all right, brother. I hear what you're saying. I will leave. He said, I want you to understand this so you stay the f off our campground. And I said okay. Well, them are fighting words, so let's just have a conversation right now. I said I want you to know something about me. I said I want you to know I'm a Christian pastor. And he said okay. And I said and it seems to me that you are unfamiliar with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, but I am familiar with the laws of the land. You're trespassing. I said, okay, I understand what is, what is, what is important to you, and I will move on. I wanted to engage him further, but you can't in Georgia. Now, I might be able to in California. I might be able to in Minnesota, but in Georgia, the fact that I was on private property, he could pull something out, pew, pew, and no consequences. <laughs> right? So I said, I don't, this, this ain't a time to tell anybody about Jesus. This is a time to come home to my kids, right? So I said, okay, and I just left. But what came to my mind is this, this, this passage in Luke chapter 20 that we are studying. When they, they approach him, and this is towards the end of what we're studying today. When they approach him and they, they say to him, they hand him a coin and they say, you know, basically, should we pay taxes? And he says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, right? Render unto God that which is God's. And this passage has been used to justify empirical behavior for centuries. It's Caesar's. Render it to Caesar. Well, you know, as Elder Elliot talked about Sabbath this morning, it wasn't Caesar until Caesar came up on the land and took it. <laughs> it didn't used to be Caesar. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it used to belong to someone else. But, but we, we use that passage to justify empirical behavior. And I don't blame the pastors preaching that. I don't. There's a million things that, as I've studied further, I've been like, oh, man, I used to preach the mess out of that. And then you realize that it's not saying what it's saying. Does that make sense? The passage after that, they go and they, they approach Jesus. They say, um, Jesus, you know, if a man dies and his brother takes his wife, yes, I ain't got no brother, but he better not, even if I did. <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> like, like, I call some of y'all brother, but if I'm gone, don't even think about it. <laughs> ain't happening. <laughs> If you do, they better not let guns in heaven, because I'm <laughs> listen. Um, so, but 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 they approach him and they say, whose wife will should be in the resurrection? First of all, it shows you that they view women as a commodity. So right then, we are completely off of God's plan, right? Secondly, that that passage is not about marriage. It's about the resurrection. And a lot of times we miss these things. And it's the same why, reason why a lot of times in the church things don't happen how they should happen. Because pastors are not, do not have MBAs. Right? Pastors do not, we, we are not accountants, controllers, right? We, pastors are educated in theology. Period. End of story. We learn Greek and Hebrew, but why do we learn Greek and Hebrew? So that we can de develop theology. Not so we can go talk to Greeks and Hebrews, right? <laughs> but I, I do think that once you bring varying perspectives 
into the conversation, it can help to bring dimensions to the word of God. Does that make sense? Listen, I want to hear from you finance experts about what the Bible says about money. Because I could give you some theology on money. But that gives one perspective of what the Bible is really trying to say. If you're an accountant and you read the word of God where it talks about money, you're going to get insight this theologian would never get. Does that make sense? I, I, want to, I want to hear from the medical experts when the Bible talks about the herb is for the healing of the nation. We'll have that discussion another time. I, I, want, to, I want to hear from you medical experts when the Bible talks about the, the body is the temple of, God, of the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm a theologian. I can give you some theology on that. But I want to hear from the medical experts uh, the significance of that. But we've allowed everything to be based on theology only. Right? But once we get other perspectives in, and if you haven't noticed so far, my master's and my doctorate in cultural anthropology heavily influence my biblical exegesis. Right? And I believe that I believe that when we, when we, I, I I don't want to say that this is the only perspective that is beneficial. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. But it is a perspective that's beneficial. And if we look at, at especially Luke, there's a reason why I, I I chose Luke. But we saw it in John also, and Matthew and Mark do it as well. But Luke is unique in that he is a PhD like Dr. James, and he's Breaking down an argument into pieces that can be understood by his readers. In fact, he's got several arguments he's making in Luke, and he continued them in Acts. And one of the arguments that he is making is that the gospel, are y'all still with me? That the gospel is inherently subversive to empire and to empirical behavior. You may have to say that again. That the Bible is inherently subversive. In other words, that it inherently undermines the empire and those who behave like the empire. If you are in the business of oppression, the gospel got something for you. Remember the white horse that we talked about? If you are in the business of oppression, the Bible got the white horse. It does not have the, the donkey that represents peace for you. Unless you get out of that business. Remember when we studied Revelation. We're about to get into Luke. Remember when we studied Revelation. Remember how we noted at the beginning of Revelation. That Revelation is a continuation of what? Anyone remember? The Gospels, Right? We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Revelation. It's a story, right? Revelation is a continuation of the Gospels. And if we get to Revelation, and by the time Revelation is done, Jesus has come and completely dismantled and destroyed earthly Babylonian powers of oppression and empire, right? And we see that by the time we get to Revelation, it must be present... And Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Are y'all with me? Remember we started Luke. And we get to a prayer, mothers. We get to a prayer that is prayed by who? It's called the Magnificent. It's called the Magnificent. Or some say Magnificent. It's prayed by, anyone remember? Anyone familiar with Catholicism? Because they're big on this. It's prayed by Mary, right? Mother of Jesus, right? And what does she say? She says, my soul, this is chapter 1, verse 46, verse 47, for those who want to write it down and read it at home. She, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty, he who is what? Mighty. She's establishing at the beginning of Luke that God is what? Mighty, has done great things for who? For me, she says. And holy is his name. 
and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. This is a subversive prayer. And exalted those of humble estates. She begins the gospel of Luke by saying that the intention of Jesus coming is to bring the high low and exalt the low. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. The gospel of Luke, and really the entire gospel message, is one which says, look, God is in the business of helping the oppressed, including those oppressed by sin, which is all of us. And he is in the business of bringing low those who oppress. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you that we never have anything to fear in this life. Never. Not for one minute. Things get difficult at times. And things are easy at times. But no matter what chapter of life we find ourselves in, we have a hope of a Savior who died to set us free in every capacity. Free from sin, free from the chains of chasing economics, free from those who would control our hearts and our minds, free, Lord, from our own propensity towards things that are against you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you set us free and we have the hope that one day you'll put an end to all this mess and take us to be with you forever. Bless us as we read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 20, real quick um, background. Remember, this entire passage started with Jesus Jesus had the uh, interaction with the rich young ruler, right? And what the rich young ruler do? He said, we keep all the commandments. Stay with me. Y'all still with me now, right? Um, 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 He said, I keep all the commandments. I do all that. Jesus said, give up all your goods and give it to the poor. And and then he's like, can't do that, Jesus. Walks away. Jesus says, listen, man, I wish he would have stuck around because it's harder for a camel to get into the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to get into heaven. But guess what? With God, all things are possible. Then he says what? He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. Why, why does he say he's going to Jerusalem? Because he's going to die and he's going to get up. The disciples are like, I don't understand what you're saying. You're not making any sense, Jesus, but we've been following you for three years. We'll just continue following you. Then what does he do? He goes through Jericho, right? Then, then uh, we get close to Jerusalem and all the people are exalting him as king, right? Y'all, y'all remember the story? I know it's a lot of context, but you got to have the context to understand the passage, right? So, so, and he doesn't stop them because he is finally in his ministry saying, yes, I am king of kings and lord of lords. And so then he, he approaches Jerusalem and he starts to cry. Why does he start to cry? He says, man, because I tried to get you to accept me and you would not. So a time is going to come when, when stone won't be left on top of stone, right? And then he get and, and, and it, it was, it's interesting, um, you know, something I love real quick, if I could interject this. I remember a couple weeks ago, Elder Richardson came up to me, and he, he told me about something he had studied in a passage that I preached on that I had missed, right, or that I hadn't brought out, and he brought it out. I love it. I, I, you know why I love it? Because I'm trying, I, all I want to do is just have it so we can all study the Bible deeply together Amen. and enrich one another. That's my number one purpose. This last week, Brother De La Cruz came to me. He said, you remember when, when the, the Pharisees and the leaders told Jesus to stop having his people exalt his name as he was approaching Jerusalem? And he says, if, if these people don't cry out, the stones will cry out. He said, if you look at that pathway, right, Brother De La Cruz? He said, if you look at that road as it enters Jerusalem, there is graveyards on every side. And guess what is on top of those graveyards? 
And these graveyards are in a place. I went and looked it up, brother. You, you, you piqued my interest. These graveyards are in a place that floods often. Have you ever been to New Orleans? In New Orleans, they don't put their graves in the ground, right? Because it floods often. What they do is they put their graves above ground. And what do they build them out of? Stone, right? So he was saying, listen, if they don't say that I am king of kings and lord of lords, these graves are going to open up. And these people right here are going to say that I am king of kings and lord of lords. Listen, blew my mind, brother. Amen, Amen right? We're not even to the passage we're studying today. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to have to make this quick because I got 20 minutes to knock this whole thing out. Listen. So, we, so he gets to Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us that he, he, he cleanses the sanctuary, right? He's whipping them, getting all the money changers and everything out. And the Bible tells us in Matthew that he, he sat down and started to teach. And he wouldn't even let people carry things back and forth while he was teaching in the temple. And then we get to Luke chapter 20, our passage for, the, for today. And let me start at verse 1. It says, one day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from, and Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So they tried to trap Jesus, and he trapped them. But it also tells us, remember we discussed, that they understood who Jesus was. They heard John preach. They understood who Jesus was. Then we get to verse 9. It says, and he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard. And let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. And he sent another servant. But they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. And he sent yet a third. This one also they wounded and cast out. Remember we... Find the characters, ask the questions, look for Jesus. Ask the questions. Who are these servants? Who's Jesus talking about? The prophets, right? He sent the prophets over and over again to his people. And what they do to the prophets? First they exalted them, right? Then they killed them. That's why I tell the elders, family first. Because the same people who exalt you will kill you. Sermon for another day. Verse 13, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Who is this? Jesus. Jesus. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. Listen, we we have been seeing in, in Luke a power struggle, right? The religious leaders felt that It was their duty to oversee Jerusalem and oversee uh, Israel, both politically and spiritually, right? And so they felt that was their job. And here comes the son of the most high. And he's like, listen, I got this from here. I got this. And they're like, no, you don't. This is our thing. We got this. And what they end up doing? Killing him because they felt as if the inheritance... Was theirs. Amen. Are we playing catch up here? Get that back to Marvin. All right? All right. <laughs> so they, they end up killing Jesus because they felt like it was their job to, 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 to oversee the people spiritually. Here, buddy. We got to cut the distractions just a little bit. Come over here, okay? There we go. So they killed Jesus because they felt like it was their inheritance, right? The Bible continues on verse 15. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? And watch when Jesus asks this question. Watch what the people say. Verse 16. He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. 
Listen to what the story said. The owner of the vineyard sent his servants first over and over again. And the people either treated them bad or just right out and straight up killed them. And, and, and we see in the next text that every, everybody understands what he's talking about. Then he sends his son. And they kill his son. And Jesus asked the people, talk about a colonized mind. Jesus asked the people, listen, they killed his servants, they killed his son. Is he going to deal harshly with them? The people are like, oh, wait, no way. No way, he'll never deal harshly with them. Surely not. They were so brainwashed to follow not Yahweh, but those who claim to be representatives and spokespersons for Yahweh. So much so that even if the, the, the same people kill God's son, it still is not enough to shake them from their allegiance to these people. Ouch. Look what Jesus says, verse 17. But he looked directly at them. This ain't no hippie Jesus skipping with the tulips and putting flowers in his hair. There might have been a time for that because he, Jesus is everything, right? But at this moment, that was not this, that Jesus. The Bible says he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written in Psalm 118? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Real quick, because we got just a few minutes left. The cornerstone. What's the significance of that? We don't use what we envision as cornerstones very often today. But if you ever travel to other places, like for example, we were in Mexico City. Every building you come upon, there's, if you literally go to the corner of the building, there's a stone near the bottom that will have the address and the date. So it'll say 680, because maybe it's 680 L. Ferdinand Boulevard or whatever. And so it'll be 680. Then on the other side, it'll say the year that the building was built. So it might say 1892 on it, right? It's a cornerstone, because a cornerstone does two things. One, it tells you where you are in space and time. So you are at 680 El Ferdinand Boulevard, right? And, and, and you are at a place that was built in 1892. Where you are in space and time, it's a guide to let you know your position, right? But also, when I was building, I, I, you, you can give me a hand clap after service, you know, high five, pat me on the back, but I built a greenhouse in our backyard. Only thing that's growing in there right now is weed, but there is a greenhouse in our backyard. <laughs> now, I built the greenhouse, but the first step to the greenhouse was to lay the foundation, right? And in order to lay the foundation, I first had to even out the land. Then I put down one with those uh, concrete stones, like bricks, right? These large mason bricks, right? Put it down, and I had to take a level and level this mason brick. Make sure it was perfectly level in every direction. Then what I did was I took another mason brick and I put it next to it, but now I made sure that it was perfectly even and leveled with the first mason brick. Because the first mason brick is my cornerstone. So it doesn't just let me know where I am in space and time, but it is the standard by which all other stones are then measured. Come on now. Jesus is saying, listen, Jesus, listen, man. Do you know, before this moment, when they wanted to, because they wanted to kill Jesus all along, right? But they had to send people to Jesus because he was out in Judea and, and all these places. Jesus walks right up in their building. Wouldn't even let people carry things through anymore. Had all the people, because, you know, real quick, 
Is it, can I have five extra minutes today? Listen, because this thing is juicy, man. Do you know I found out this week that those, those people selling those doves and oxen and, and goats and lambs and all this stuff in the sanctuary weren't even the farmers who grew them things. <laughs> what they would do is they would pay these farmers pennies. And then they'd take them, so they fleece the farmers, and then they'd take them to the sanctuary and fleece the worshipers that they came in with these, these crazy high prices. Sound like a grocery store. <laughs> a gas station. <laughs> so, so, so he cleaned those people out. And then he, would, he, was, he took control of the sanctuary. He said, who can and can't carry things in and out of the sanctuary? And he's teaching in the sanctuary. And then he sits up in there. He says, I am the cornerstone. I'm the one who guides you, lets you know whether you're right or wrong. I am the standard by which everything is measured. Jesus is gangster. Like, seriously. He got a lot of nerve. If this ain't a revolutionary, then nobody is. This man was starting a revolution with himself at the head. He was like, he went up in their place and said, y'all are the, y'all are the, y'all are the villains in this thing, and I'm the cornerstone. You remember earlier in Luke, Luke chapter 11, he went up in their house. Pharisees said, hey, Jesus, come to dinner. Let's, let's, let's chop it up a little bit. He went in there. He said, you whitewashed graves. And the Sadducees are like, Jesus, you can't insult the Pharisees because if you insult them, you're insulting us. He said, yeah, you are some thieves who put burdens on people that they, that they don't deserve. This Jesus does not play around. When people are robbing and oppressive to his people, his children, he does not play around. He takes the fight to them. So he's up in the sanctuary. And watch, watch, watch what he says. I love this because... He quotes Psalm 118, but then he adds to it. And, 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 and my sister, when you read the, the, the scripture earlier, I, I love that you read it from the KJV. Some of y'all are like, what? <laughs> Listen, we talked about how people couldn't read the Bible because it was in Latin, but we want people to speak in English that was outdated when it was first written. Anyway. So, I, but I, I love the KJV sometimes, and I loved it this morning because it, 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 in, in the other versions, it says, Verse 18, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And I love how in the KV, KJV it says, it will grind him to powder. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's like, listen, I am the cornerstone, but hey, check this out. Everyone who falls on me will be broken to pieces, and when I fall on you, I'm going to grind you to powder. Yeah. He's not playing around. He's on the white horse, right? Yeah. But before, remember in our study, but before he got on the white horse, Elder Richardson, what did he get on first? He got on the donkey, which symbolizes that he wanted peace. And then he approaches Jerusalem with a tear in his eyes because he wanted peace. But all they will accept yeah. is war. Verse 19. Before we go there, subversive to empire and empirical behavior. These are people, these religious leaders had commandeered the gospel before the gospel. Everything that happened in the Old Testament was pointing towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? They had commandeered it so that they could gain on the backs of the people. And Jesus marched up and said, when I'm around, we're not doing this anymore. This ain't happening anymore. And listen, they were not the empire, but they had empirical behavior. They did it sometimes on behalf of the empire, but sometimes they did it for their own gain. And some of them were doing it because that is what was handed to them. And that's the way it's always been done. And I fear 
brothers and sisters, that we who have this last day message of our God destroying the empire. Some of y'all got your phones out, gonna get me in trouble. Listen, now go ahead, listen. I ain't scared, right? My Jesus is gangster, all right? He walk up in the temple. Listen, listen. We have this last day message of a God who destroys empires. But we dictate people's lives. And that they have to act like the colonized, empirical way that we were taught to act. Yeah. Or they are unacceptable to God. Uh-oh. Y'all was laughing and saying amen until I said that. Listen, that is empirical behavior. You know, I think I've told the story before, but, but I'm trying not to go too long. We got the ladies, dinner for ladies and everything. But I lunch for the ladies, and it might be dinner by the time I get done. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> um, there, there, I've told this story to a few of you before. There is a, a, a school for Native Americans called Holbrook Indian School. I hate that it's still called Indian School. But Holbrook School in, um, in Arizona. This school used to be ran by primarily people of European descent. And what taught, was taught was at this school was that, hey, um, you Native American children, you can't wear your hair long. Got to keep it shaved. Unless you're a woman, then you can go ahead and wear it long. Heard that before. Anyway. <laughs> um, they, they, they told them that their traditional ways are heathen and pagan. You can't practice them anymore. You need to learn to come to church Sabbath morning with a suit and tie on. Ladies, make sure your dress is down to your ankles. And it's all denim. <laughs> you seen them dresses, right? <laughs> like, 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 th th that's, that's what they taught them. They have to look like, act like. These are people who have a history of, of churches coming to their doors and ripping their children from their arms. And then they never see their children again. And if they do, their children return to them destroyed on the inside. And if they survive these, these schools, then their, their rate of suicide is through the roof. And we set up a school and essentially do the same thing to them. That's empirical behavior. But then this, this, a conference in California took over the school and said, we're going to put Native American teachers in there. We're going to put Native American, Native American principal in there. We're going to teach them how to, teach, how to worship Jesus in their traditional ways, grow their hair, how their hair traditionally is grown. We're going to let them be Native American. And all the different array of different tribes and cultures that, that encompasses, we're going to let them be that. But just be that while worshiping Jesus. And guess what? The rate of suicide and alcohol use went down to near zero. The rate of graduation, which was near zero, went up to almost 100%. Children started giving their lives to Jesus. We cut out the empirical behavior and changes started happening. People's lives got better. Listen, you don't have to be the empire to act like the empire. And Jesus is very clearly anti-empire. Look at this. Continuing on. Give me eight more minutes. Verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he had told this parable against him. Well, yes, he had. But they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere, that they might catch him in something he said, so as to deliver him up to the authorities and jurisdiction of the governor. So they asked him, so now they're like, okay, well, now we got to get the empire involved. So they asked him, teacher, we know that you speak and teach rightly and show no partiality, 
but truly teach the way of God. I, you know, this, this touched my soul and made me happy. Because you know how often a pastor hears that? Pastor, we, we, love, we love your preaching. We love what you teach. But you need to teach the way of God. I remember when I, my, like my second year in the ministry, you know, preaching Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Y'all aren't the first ones to get it. Amen. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> uh, but, but just doing that, this lady came up to me. Pastor, love your preaching. I need you to preach on obedience. I'm like, I've been preaching on obedience since I got here. Since I've been teaching people to be obedient to Jesus instead of to you. Listen, and this thing about present truth, present truth, present truth. The only present truth is Jesus, period. Period. And the crazy thing is, is people will say, yo, pastor, you're not preaching present truth. When you are literally preaching the same prophecies that these present truth preachers preach, but you're, you're centering it around Jesus, and so it doesn't sound the same anymore, and people say you aren't preaching present truth. Well, my question is, if it doesn't sound the same once you center it around Jesus, which one should you be teaching? That was even quieter than the thing about colonization. <laughs> are you hearing me this morning? They come to him. This is Jesus. And they're like, listen, we like the way you've been preaching. We like the way you've been preaching, but truly teach the way of God. Verse 22. Is it lawful for us to give tribute to Caesar or not? But he perceived their craftiness. Because my Jesus is gangster. And said to them, show me a denarius. Understand what a denarius is. A denarius is like a day's wages, right? Mm -hmm. And on this denarius is the insignia of this man named Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus is his name. His face is on this thing. Keep that in mind. Whose likeness and this inscription does it have? They said Caesar's. He said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able in the presence of the people to catch him in what he said, but marveling at his answer, they became silent. Can I tell you who this man, Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus, is and why his name is Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus? Is that Okay. This is the cultural anthropologist, Elder McTavish. <laughs> Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus was Caesar. He was emperor of Rome at the time that Jesus was alive. He became emperor, I believe, in A.D. 17. And the reason why his name is Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus is because he is the adopted son, really the grandson, of a man by the name of Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the adopted son, really the grandson, no, I believe the grandnephew, of a man named Julius Caesar. You've heard of Julius Caesar, right? Julius Caesar was the, he was the, not the, he was a dictator in Rome. He was the first dictator in Rome. And he was the, he ruled over Rome during the time of civil war. But the people loved Julius Caesar. And they felt that he was a benevolent emperor. He you know, wasn't technically an emperor, but they felt that he was a benevolent emperor. Y'all still with me? Yeah. And so they, 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 they did not like that certain people in his government were able to engage in civil war against him. He was highly liked. And so when he died, what they did, the civil war had just ended, and what they did was they deified him. They said, he is now a god. This is Julius Caesar that he is now a god. There's a man named Antony who rules. He's not technically the ruler. They had no ruler in Rome until a man named Octavius became old enough to become emperor of Rome. Who was Octavius? Am I losing you? You still with me? Octavius was the, I believe the grandnephew, but the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And so when Octavius became Caesar, he took on the name Augustus, which means savior. 
no. Starting to come together? And these people believed him to be a savior because Rome, uh, Antony was a horrible ruler who, who wanted to fight people and always had Roman wars and those things. And so uh, they, they noticed that Octavius was a man who was a, a person of peace. He brought people together. So under his rulership, Rome was at peace. See, some of y'all nodding off. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. If you need to stand up in the back, feel free. I won't be offended. We're almost there. And, and, and so they said that he was a man of peace. He was the savior of Rome, son of God. Remember, his daddy, Julius Caesar, was now a god. Son of God, savior, king of peace. So this man rules. He dies. Tiberius becomes emperor. And what they used to do is whenever they quoted something that Augustus said, they called it the Evangelion, which means the good news, or we call it the gospel. So whenever it was recorded what Augustus said, it was the gospel. Son of God. The Savior. So here comes Jesus, enters the scene. He's about to be born. And this is in the beginning of Luke. Luke chapter 2. And watch what the angel says uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the people. It says, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news, Evangelion, of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Augustus. Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord, with Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace. Jesus' very life was subversive to the Roman Empire, who had set themselves up a Savior, a Son of God, who was to bring peace on earth. And so they hand Jesus this coin yeah. with the insignia of this Savior, yeah. Son of God, yeah. King of Peace. Yeah. And Jesus says, looks at it, he says, man, give the Caesar what Caesar's. I can just envision him flipping the coin back at them. Give this, this coin got Caesar's face on it. Let, let Caesar have this coin, because guess what? Everything else belongs to me. Listen, he is walking up in this temple. He's saying these religious leaders, you're not the game anymore. Now it's about me. Hey, empire, it ain't about you anymore. Now it's about me. I am king of kings, lord of lords. Don't you know? And, and we're going to get into this next week. But in the very next section, they come to him. And they say to him, Jesus all this stuff, like who's going to be marrying who in the resurrection. And look what he says. And we're wrapping up with this. He says to them, this is verse 37 of chapter 20. He says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. What does that mean for you and I? What does it mean for you and I that Jesus is subversive to kingdoms? What does it mean to you and I that Jesus is subversive even to empirical behavior? What does it mean to us that there is a resurrection and that God is the God of the living? What it means is that when Jesus started on his journey after his encounter with the rich young ruler, and he said, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to be resurrected. What it means is that resurrection was not just for him. Come on, somebody. That resurrection was for you and for me. And it does not matter what happens in this life. There is no reason to fear. Because the one true God is your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
There's no empire that can usurp his authority. He's the one in charge. And so things may oppress you in this life. Sin may oppress you in this life. Systems may oppress you in this life. Depression might oppress you in this life. But there is a life to come. And the reason there is a life to come is because there's only one Savior. Come on, somebody. And his name is Jesus. And he's my Savior and your Savior. And our Savior went to the cross. He went to the cross for you and I. But what the cross did did not stay done. Come on, somebody. He got up Sunday morning. And because he got up Sunday morning, there is hope that you and I one day will get up, whether we get up from a grave or those, who are, or those of us who are blessed to see his coming with our own eyes. We will get up from sin and heartache and depression and pain. The one true God. There is no other. Listen, what's his name? Ted Wilson ain't God. You hear me? Give the Caesar what's Caesar, but that's that, but he ain't God. Listen, I am not God. You hear me? That's why the goal is not to get you to believe what I'm saying. The goal is to teach you to study for yourselves. I have no heaven for you. No leader, no system, no denomination has a heaven for you. As great as it may be, no, no, no church, no nation, no nothing has a heaven for you. I love the 28, but they have no heaven for you. You hear me this morning? There's only one who has a heaven for you. And he went to the cross to make sure you could have it. I asked for five extra and I took 15. You know, this week, I, um, I'm blessed to have the wife I have. If, if y'all haven't noticed, I don't have the greatest posture. And the reason is I've been dealing with tightness and pain for years. Like, standing up straight hurt. You hear me? And it's because I have a tendency to not take time to care for me. So I have a wife who made sure she took time to care for me. She went and she said, babe, I'm using 100 bucks and scheduling you a massage. And I said, baby, don't do that. We don't, we don't need to put $100 on me like that. And before I knew it, she done did it. She walked up and said, it's 10 o'clock Friday, be there. I'm like, what? <laughs> 10 o'clock what? What are you talking about? I got an appointment at 10 o'clock. I can't be there at 10 o'clock. This is Friday morning. She's texting me. Make sure you're there 15 minutes before. You got to fill out paperwork. I already paid for it. If you want to add anything on, go ahead there. But the massage is paid for. Like forcing me into this massage. I went in there. Sister Harvey is like a beat up puppy dog. Being forced into this, this thing that's good for me. I went and I laid on that table. This, she, she signed me up for a deep tissue because she knew I needed it. And listen, I am sore today. I may not be standing up straight the whole time, but I can. I just got to get back in the habit. Listen, this lady looked like she's like power lifter. She came in. So you want a deep tissue today? Rob? Why is your voice lower than mine? She put me on this table, babe. This lady, I've had a lot. I've had... A lot of pain in my life. I never tapped out. I'm the kind, I don't tap out. You know what I'm saying? The brother, she was working on this spot right here. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> pain like, like the best pain you could ever feel. And it was because the pain was setting me free. Come on, somebody. The pain was setting me free. I walked out of Massage Envy, not an, not an advertisement. But listen, I walked out free from things I didn't even realize was besetting me. She did this one thing on my arm. I didn't know you could get tightness in your forearms. But she set it free. 
Like, I didn't even know the chains that were on me. But as soon as I got in touch, come on, somebody, with an expert, she handled things for me. And I walked out with a freedom I didn't even know I, had, I was lacking. There's something about getting in touch with Jesus. You don't realize that you've been walking around like this because of how things have just been piled on you through the years and you've been taught you have to do this, have to do that in order to be accepted by Jesus. When Jesus says, just come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Just come to me and we will work on the rest. And he did it all for you. And he continues to do it all for us. Let's pray. Jesus, listen, it's all we can say, Jesus, is thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that there's no system, no organization, no powerful individual, nobody, Jesus, who can keep us from you. There's nothing, Lord, no matter how big, that can separate us from our Savior the one true God, the one who rules heaven and earth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you chose to fix a problem we created. Thank you, Jesus, that you are so passionate about us that you would go to the cross to save us, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are our lawyer in the courtroom. You are our judge in the courtroom. And you took our place as the defendant in the courtroom. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that we will not hesitate to put you first. The things that have been on our mind just weighing us down. Give us the willingness to throw them at your feet, Jesus. The heartache we feel. Put it at your feet, Jesus. And Lord, may we never fear anyone or anything. When we know the one who builds up kingdoms and tears them down. But may we always know that our hope lies in the one who's coming on a white horse to vanquish your enemies and ours, to take us to eternity with you, Jesus. Wherever we'll here, Sister Stevenson seen Beulah land all over again, where the loved ones we lost along the way will not be walking with a limp, but we'll be jumping and praising our Savior with us, Lord. Until that day comes, Jesus, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and we thank you that you never leave us lonely. In your name we pray, amen. Mothers, I'm sorry I took some of your time, but I appreciate your time. God bless each and every one of you.